Welcome to Why Internet Freedom Matters for Nonprofits and Libraries, and how we can all help defend it. My name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup, where I work to help bring resources like this out to our broader nonprofit and library community. Prior to joining TechSoup, Seven years ago I worked for a decade in Washington, D.C. with small nonprofits where I often was the person having to make technology decisions for my organization. I'm glad to be your host today and really excited to have our presenter with us, Rebecca McKinnon, who is really a, an extraordinary leading voice in this topic and in this area. And so we're really thrilled to have her join us. She directs the Ranking Digital Rights Project at New America. She's also the author of Consent of the Network, The Worldwide Struggle for Internet Freedom, and the co-founder of the International Citizen Media Network, Global Voices Online. In the late 90s and early 2000s, she was CNN's Bureau Chief and Correspondent in Beijing and Tokyo, and she now lives in Washington, D.C., and we're thrilled to have her. As I mentioned, Rebecca is in Washington, D.C. I'm based here in San Francisco along with my colleague Allie. Where are you? Go ahead and let us know where you're joining us from so we can see where all of our participants are at today. Feel free to chat into the window. We know you can't see all of the comments that are being shared out and chatted. So if there are things that you have to say that we think are useful to share back with the rest of the audience, we'll be sure to do that. We have people mentioning that they're in Florida, Texas, New Jersey, South Carolina, all over the country. So we're so glad to have you all on. Looking at our agenda for today, I'll do a quick introduction of TechSoup for those of you who aren't familiar with what we do. And then we'll ask you some questions. So what do you think is the greatest threat to Internet freedom? And you'll have an opportunity to do a live poll with us. And then Rebecca is going to take over and talk about what's going on out in the world right now. There's a lot of news related to Internet freedom, and she'll cover some of those big stories around big data, privacy, censorship, and surveillance, and then some things that we can do about it, how to create a movement for sustainable cyberspace around the world. There will be time for Q&A and additional resources later on, but feel free to ask them at any time. TechSoup Global is a network of 63 partner NGOs serving 121 countries around the world to provide technology resources and support to help you meet your mission. We are doing this all over the globe, which you can see, and we're working towards a time when every social benefit organization has the technology, resources, and knowledge it needs to operate at its full potential. We do that in a variety of ways, including events like this, but we also do it in providing technology donations from some corporate partners like Microsoft, Adobe, Cisco, in the tune of almost $5 billion worth of savings to the nonprofit and social sectors. You can learn more about those programs at TechSoup.org. So on to the topic of the day. Go ahead and click on your screen. You can select as many of these as you think are applicable. What do you think is the greatest threat to Internet freedom? And I guess because it says greatest threat, it assumes that you're going to select the most important one to you. But you can select more than one, and you're welcome to chat in any other options that you think are important that I may not have included on this list. There certainly are a lot of threats to Internet freedom today. So let us know what you think by participating in this poll. This helps give us an idea of where you're at, what you think, and it also helps inform Rebecca as to kind of the areas that you're most concerned with. And she'll get to covering many of these in a few minutes here. So go ahead and take a moment. I'll leave this up so that everybody has a chance to participate. Just give a few more seconds to let you click on that screen. And it looks like 50, almost 55% say overreach of government surveillance is the greatest threat to Internet freedom right now. And another 50% say lack of privacy for personal info. Those are certainly big threats. And then the other one is corporate control of Internet. So those are certainly real threats that we're all encountering right now. So with that in mind, I'd like to welcome our presenter today, Rebecca McKinnon. We're so glad to have you joining us. Thanks so much for, for being on the program. Thank you so much, Becky. It's, it's just really great to be here with your community. And I've, I've known about TechSoup for a long time and, and uh, have heard from a lot of people about just what a great resource it is. So it's a real honor to be here with you guys today. Um, and just, just uh, you know, shame, in the shameless plug department, I wrote a book a few years ago. It came out in 2012 
called ostentatiously Consent of the Networked, the Worldwide Struggle for Internet Freedom. Um, I can't say it without using that voice because it's sort of an ostentatious title, but a lot of the things I'm going to uh, talk about today sort of draw from many of the ideas that came out in that book, which obviously events have overtaken us. Um, Snowden came out with his revelations about NSA surveillance after the book came out, and I sort of felt like saying I told you so a little bit. But, uh, you know, um, as such is life. Um, but in any case, uh, moving on to the present day, um, as all of you know from watching and reading the news, um, there were these horrendous terror attacks um, in Paris not long ago at the offices of uh, the Charlie Hebdo magazine and, and elsewhere. Uh, and one of the reactions um, that, that came out of this um, came from the um, president of France, um, who is calling for more controls on the Internet because he's concerned that terrorists are using social media like Facebook and Twitter to organize and recruit, and that there needs to be more control over what kinds of speech social networks allow and don't allow um, because of concerns that that uh, terrorists are, are using the Internet. Um, and um, specifically, he's calling for companies to be held legally responsible for what their users are doing on their platforms. Um, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, I'll talk a bit more about them later, but this is one of the um, uh, organizations that is dedicated to defending um, Internet users' rights around the world. They came out with a response to Holan's call for more control. Um, saying that this is the wrong response, saying that yes, these attacks are horrific, yes, it is true that a lot of really evil people use the Internet, um, but holding companies legally responsible uh, for everything that their users might do uh, on those platforms is not the solution, that it can lead to censorship, that it can lead to good people, to nonprofits, to activists, um, being also censored. And the technical kind of legal term for holding Internet companies responsible for their users' activity is intermediary liability because the, the uh, Internet company is sort of you know, an intermediary and holding them liable. And in this country, actually, we've had issues and debates about this. Um, some of you may remember that in the beginning of 2012, Wikipedia went dark um, for, for roughly a day in protest over legislation that was being proposed by our Congress that was meant to protect basically copyright holders from piracy on the Internet that was going to hold companies liable um, for copyright violations committed by users. And this was the Stop Online Piracy Act and then also a, a um, companion piece of legislation. And there was a huge online protest against this and rallying people to call their Congress uh, congressional rep representatives and senators and, and managed to stop this legislation. But one of the big issues here and one reason why, why there was such a rallying call against this, this legislation was the concern that it would be abused. That yes, there are, you know, there's online piracy that, you know, may be illegal, but um, the laws can be abused if you're holding companies um, accountable for what their users are doing online. Companies are going to feel pressure to over-censor even things that aren't violating the law or even things that might fall within fair use or that are artistic or journalistic uh, and, and speech will be chilled. And also there were a bunch of other technical requirements in that legislation that really mimicked the kind of censorship that goes on in places like China um, that, that people just felt was going to lend itself to a global Internet that just becomes much more censored and controlled. And so these are issues that continue to come up. Um, and it's really hard balance. I saw that some of you in, 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 in your poll 
um, indicated that online extremism um, is a problem, and it certainly is. But we, we have an issue in the world today in, in terms of we just don't know what the right kind of rules and structures are. And I'm showing a picture of a desert here, and you're wondering, what does that have to do with the Internet? Well, the, the reason I'm showing a picture of a desert is that a, a good friend of mine named Rosenthal Alves, who's a professor of journalism in the University of Austin, Texas, used to, likes to talk about the pre-internet age as an information desert. So our laws about information, uh, about speech, were all designed, and, and our entire social structure and sort of economy around information and speech was all based on the assumption that information is scarce, information scarcity. But then the rains came, the internet showed up, and now we have a rainforest. And the number of organisms and, and the proliferation of new innovations, you can't keep track of it, it's, a, it's an information overabundance. And how do you, what kind of structures do you put in place um, assuming that you do want governance, assuming that you don't want to live in a state of nature where, where life is nasty, brutish, and short, and um, the, the strong survive over the weak, assuming that you do want some form of governance and rules going on, what are the appropriate rules in, the, in, 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 a, in a universe where information is, is just so abundant um, that that you can't control it. And you and the challenge we're facing today is a real need to kind of rethink how we approach, you know, just the whole series of laws and social structures to deal with that. And as I sort of implied earlier, you know, now as citizens or or in you know if if we're nonprofits or you know, what we call civil society, our relationship with government, with society more broadly, with the economy, is increasingly, you know, mediated. It's, it's dependent on the Internet, on mobile platforms, that in order to kind of get anything done, in order to communicate, um, in, in, in terms of just understanding what our government is doing, communicating with our government, uh, we're dependent on the Internet. But how do you make sure that these platforms you're using, um, that uh, the services you're using are actually being run, are being shaped, being governed in a way that respects your civil liberties, that respects your human rights, that are open, um, interoperable, and enable everyone to participate um, in, in a way that uh, is compatible with a democratic society. And that's the big challenge. You know, how do you make sure that the Internet is serving the citizens' interest and not just the interest of the companies um, uh, that uh, are creating most of the platforms and products and, and government that's regulating it? And, and that's the huge challenge. And one of the examples before the NSA Snowden revelations came out, um, there was a, a guy in Germany named Mal Malta Spitz. He's, he's a member of the Green Party who did an experiment that's actually hard to do in the United States because in Germany the law made, made it possible for him to ask his phone company, ask his mobile phone company to give him all the data about everywhere he'd been, you know, everywhere that a cell tower had tracked him over a period of several weeks. And so he got all this data and then a local newspaper made an interactive map of absolutely everywhere he had been according to his cell phone company over the period of several weeks, just, just as a way of showing just the, the extent to which these platforms and services are a choke point and a collector of all this data about you that, of course, you're wanting to use the cell phone, you're wanting to use the service, but it collects all this stuff, and how do you make sure that information is not going to be abused? And, you know, again, uh, pre-Snowden, in 2006, that was the first time we began to hear about um, what might be the NSA mass surveillance happening on our on our phone networks um, and internet service providers. A uh, employee 
um, or a former employee named Mark Klein at AT AT&T in San Francisco blew the whistle on the existence of a secret NSA-controlled room uh, in an AT&T facility. Um, And uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation that I mentioned earlier actually has been involved with a lawsuit that's, that's lasted basically a decade over the discovery of this facility. And of course, then Edward Snowden comes out um, last or two years ago now, my goodness, time flies, um, and uh, confirms, yes, the NSA has built an infrastructure that allows it to intercept almost everything. Um, And of course, many of you have pointed out you're very concerned about the level of surveillance and unaccountable surveillance going on in our society that Snowden has revealed. At at the same time, um, a lot of companies are reacting to this and are concerned that they're going to lose user trust if they don't take steps to kind of put some distance between themselves and the NSA and other government bodies that are trying to get at their data. And so Apple uh, and also Google with its Android mobile operating system recently announced that, that they're going to encrypt all the data on your phone so that um, even if the NSA or the law enforcement came looking for it, um, the company wouldn't actually be able to access it. And of course then you get into a debate. The, the, the director of the FBI um, has been appealing, along with many other people in the law enforcement and national security community, saying, well, you guys are just helping the criminals. And, and then, of course, the response is, well, if you guys won't, weren't abusing your access, maybe we'd be more likely to help you. But since it's documented that you're, you're, you're uh, abusing your access, Um, and because we're also concerned about security for users um, with, uh, you know, hacking and and, uh, criminal attempts to to obtain people's data. Um, Sorry, guys, we're going to keep this encrypted. And so so the industry is sort of in this standoff with law enforcement and the FBI, Um, and it's tough because there are some really legitimately bad people out there doing things, Um, Yet at the same time, how do you balance or or how how do you kind of obtain a a proper equilibrium between um, the need for security and the need for privacy, which without which we have trouble really functioning as a democracy? Um, There's also issues with censorship around the world. Now in the United States, we have a lot less censorship um, taking place, whether it be political or religious censorship um, uh, than in most other countries, but there's different types of corporate censorship that happen um, just based on the company's own decisions about what, what, user, what is appropriate for, for their users. So Apple, when it operates in China, is responding to all kinds of government requests to take things off of its Chinese app store that the Chinese government um, considers politically inflammatory. But in the United States, they're not getting government requests to take down content, but they're just making their own kind of decisions about what's, what's offensive and taking it off their app store. So there was a famous case a few years ago of a political cartoonist who won a Pulitzer Prize whose app was taken out of the App Store because somebody at Apple thought that it violated their their rules, um, you know, about offensive speech because it was making fun of the president. Um, And so that's kind of one of the examples where companies are sometimes just making their own judgment calls about what is appropriate and what isn't. Um, and you don't even know kind of how those decisions are being made, and there's no way to to appeal them. Now, I want to bring us back to sort of an an international perspective here, which is that I think a lot of us assume that because we have the Internet that the world is getting freer. But if you look at the research that's been going on, and, and this is a, a screenshot of the website of Freedom House, they do yearly reports um, where they're kind of ranking 
the, the conditions in companies around the world in terms of freedom of speech, freedom online, and so on, they have documented now that it has been eight straight years of decline in political rights and civil liberties all around the world. And they have a similar parallel decline that they've been documenting in online freedoms and press freedoms. And, and this is a global trend. Um, and so, you know, there's this assumption that, you know, if, if you look at the bottom arrow here, I often use this as a more interactive graphic, but, you know, there's an assumption I think a lot of Americans make that because we have the Internet, authoritarian countries are going to become more and more democratic over time. But one of the things I've been arguing for quite a number of years now is that we can't assume that actually. If, if, we, if we allow current trends to continue, maybe a lot of authoritarian countries might become you know, a little more open or have, a, have more public debates going on, uh, but not really democratize, whereas democracies may just kind of slide the other way. Um, because you'll have powerful incumbent forces both on the corporate side and the government side kind of slowly um, sort of architecting law and technology in their own interest. And, and how do we make sure that, that it, it doesn't sort of meet in the ugly middle like that? Um, and one other resource I'd, I'd like to point to is the Web Index, which is put out by the, the Web Foundation, which, which was created by Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who invented the World Wide Web. So he's very concerned about its health. And I just wanted to show you, I'm going to um, see if I can share my Firefox browser here and show you a couple of results they have in their latest ranking in terms of where, how the U.S. compares with some other countries. So bear with me here while I get my Firefox going, and hopefully you're seeing that, and I'm going to enlarge it. Um, and so this is the Web Index, and I've got a tab here that, that shows, let's see here. So we're going to look very specifically. This is kind of all the, the screen you're seeing now is, is basically kind of all the countries on all scores and kind of on everything the U.S. is number six, which isn't too bad. But if you scroll down here, you know, they've got all kinds of different categories which you can kind of look at at your leisure yourself later. But I'm going to the freedom and openness section here. And the U.S. is creeping down to number 14. So one of the things I think that we in the United States tend to forget is that you know, we're not the, the model for everything anymore. There's, there's a lot of countries that have actually begun to move ahead in terms of freedoms online, in terms of access. Um, if you look at net neutrality, actually this is very interesting, we creep down further. If you look at <clears throat> excuse me, safeguards to protect privacy, look, looky here, we're number 52. Um, again, big concerns. Um, if you look at things like access, um, universal access here, you know, we're sort of middling. If you look at access and affordability, again, there's a lot of countries that have gotten ahead of us here. Um, and so it's, it's interesting, I think, to poke around and look at you know, what's going on in the United States versus what other countries have shown is possible, because I think sometimes when we get kind of in our own national context, we, we lose sight of what some of the other possibilities might be or what some of the other possible conversations might be. So now I'm going to try and get out of this. Hang on here. See if my automatic. Oop. Okay. Hang. Ah, oh, there we go. Um. Let's see. This did not work. Let me just quit this browser. Sorry about the. Oops. I think I just locked up. No Am worry. I there? I just brought you oh, back. You, yep. You I got me you back. back out. Very good. Yep. I like quit everything by mistake rather than just quitting my browser. Apologies. Anyway, no problem. Uh, you got the picture there with the web index. But what's interesting is that the Web Foundation makes some basic policy recommendations, and this gets into kind of 
you know, what we should all be calling for here in our country and and globally. And um, first of all is, is, of course, push back against surveillance um, with every opportunity, make broadband affordable and accessible to all, uh, and push our elected representatives to make that a reality. Um, guarantee that all women, men, girls, and boys can access essential information. That's less of a problem in the United States than in some places, but it, there, there are still issues um, around people being able in schools, sometimes even in, in some libraries and, and public places, being able to access, um, for instance, sexual health information uh, or information about sexuality that, that uh, uh, some institutions choose to restrict to, to um, uh, young people or, or adults who are trying to access their, their networks. Um, and, and then more importantly, or, or I should say last but not least, everyone needs to be educated on what their digital rights are. The fact that your civil liberties, your human rights extend to the Internet. The Internet isn't just some kind of commercial mall where you have no rights. It's if you're not going to have your rights protected online, they're going to be degraded offline. And we need in our civics education to, to better understand that, better underscore that, and having digital literacy, understanding something about how things work, um, and who controls the tools and shapes the tools that we use is really important. And as Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, said, if, if we don't do something about all of this, if we don't take steps, there is a real danger that the interests of those who already have control, who are already sort of the incumbent power holders, are going to solidify their control and power. And we need to make sure that power is held accountable, that power abuses can be identified and held in check online as, as well as offline. And kind of moving along here, um, again, just drawing some parallels in history, what we're starting to see happening is the growth of a movement for Internet rights, for digital rights, for digital freedoms. And there's quite a bit of parallel, I, I tend to think, between what's happening with internet rights and the environmental movement. And this is a picture, it was taken on an anniversary of, of Earth Day, which the first one was in 1970. And it, it took a couple of decades to really get the environmental movement going and, and to really get legislation going in the right direction. And obviously the fight against climate change still a long-running uphill battle, but if you look at kind of where government was and where companies were in the 1970s versus where it is today, there's, there's been movement in, in the right direction. Um, and similarly, this is, this is a, a battle of a generation that's going on, and here's a demonstration in Washington, D.C. A, a couple of years ago, I didn't put the, the year on here, um, I, against this was not too long after the Snowden revelations came out, and we're seeing a global movement. This is a picture from India, um, a, a hunger strike against Internet censorship, um, that people were upset that the government was blocking um, basically speech that was making fun of politicians. Um, so this is increasingly a global movement. This is a demonstration um, in Warsaw in 2012 against a trade agreement known as the Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Act. Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Act, I'm always forgetting that acronym, ACTA. Um, which uh, was going to have a lot of elements in it that SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act that I talked about earlier on that Wikipedia was protesting against, um, you know, they were like, you know, the Americans didn't want it, and we don't want it here either. And uh, they blocked this trade agreement um, that, that many of their governments had, had actually signed on to without consulting with, with their publics. Um, another part of this movement is a global effort to try and get law enforcement and national security frameworks, in, at least in the democratic world, 
to be consistent with human rights principles when it comes to online law enforcement and surveillance activities. And so as part of this movement, um, a group of uh, nonprofits, activist organizations from around the world, um, academics, um, and others have come up with a set of 13 principles in terms of if, if, you're, if a government is going to do surveillance and you know, there can be some legitimate arguments for why surveillance might happen in terms of catching criminals, um, conducting investigations, that any laws around surveillance, any practices around surveillance need to fit 13 conditions in terms of safeguards, in terms of public oversight, in terms of due process in terms of proportionality, um, the proportion of the surveillance action has to, the, has to, the scope of the surveillance action has to fit proportionally to what it is they're looking for. Um, and this is a global human rights issue. Um, and the most, the, the recent, um, they just changed human rights commissioners, but the recent human rights commissioner for, for human rights in the, in the UN, Navi Pillay, um, has spoken out on this. Um, and unfortunately, the, the U.S. is, is uh, not in the lead, shall we say. Um, but I, since I know that there are a lot of TechSoup um, members from libraries around the world, I just want to give a shout, out, a shout out to the American Library Association that's been very active on surveillance and privacy. And so those of you who are involved with libraries, the ALA is a really great resource. Um, there's been a group of civil liberties groups um, in, in this country who've come up with a set of principles uh, for civil, civil rights and big data, and they've actually begun to um, influence White House policy around how do you make sure that when companies are, are collecting information about people, through your browser or whatever it is, through websites, it's not going to be used to discriminate against people in loans or, or other ways. Um, so you know, the leadership conference is, is sort of shepherding a, a whole coalition of groups around that. Um, there's uh, another resource I want to point everyone to is the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union has a great set of resources at dotrights.org um, that you can you know, browse and, and, and you know, sign up to take action, sign up to get involved in different ways. Um, the, elect fr the Electronic Frontier Foundation has a really great resource that they just updated called the Surveillance Self-Defense um, is sort of a module, and you can you can click around it, and depending on sort of what kind of person you are, if you're a journalist or an activist or a student or whatever, you can sort of click on different types of pro pro profiles and and kind of click through what your learn about what your risks are when it comes to surveillance and and how to protect yourself against surveillance, um, and also how to get involved, um, but. This is really, again, you know, just like we're fighting for civil liberties, it's a, it's a struggle that never ends, that, that you fight for social justice, you, you fight for better water, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're working towards, you're constantly having to be vigilant, right? You, you never kind of win, win the, the battle and then everything's solved and you don't have to worry about it again. Um, and this is, this is the work of a generation in terms of changing legislation, finding ways to hold companies accountable, demanding transparency both from the government and from the companies whose services we depend on, or from the nonprofit websites for, for that matter, you know, making sure that everybody is, is uh, really living up to their claims, you know, building movements, building social movements, uh, online and offline making sure that our, our technologies that we're using are human rights compatible. Um, that means that, you know, that in terms of privacy settings, in terms of security, in, in terms of, uh, again, equity and so on, you know, how, how, how do the technologies stack up with the kind of society we want to have? 
and just public participation in technology's future. Um, and what, what I mean by that is, you know, the digital spaces we inhabit are increasingly critical for our political part participation, our, the ability of our nonprofits to succeed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we need to make sure that those spaces we need to participate in the in the the governance of those spaces. We need to know who's controlling them or who has influence in shaping them, what's possible, what's not possible, and and get involved. Make make sure you know whether it be with your 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 political representatives or again the companies whose products you might use or whose stock you might own. You you need to be part of that conversation, just like. We want to be part of the conversation of how our city is run, uh, how our state is run, and if you're not participating, it's less likely that it's going to go in a direction that's in your interest. It's it's more likely to be in your interest if you're participating, and and so our digital spaces are, are the same way. Um, and just to wrap up, and Becky mentioned this earlier, what's also kind of exciting is that you know since we're all nonprofits here, and we all you know are thinking about funders, and there was an event that was just yesterday in New York with the Ford Foundation, Knight Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, Mozilla, Open Society Foundations, and and really kind of trying to bring a whole lot of other philanthropic organizations under the tent to say, you know, philanthropy's got to step up here, that the nonprofit sector, the civil society is not going to survive unless we really put our money into this notion that the internet and the digitally networked technologies that we depend on need to be compatible with democracy, need to be compatible with social justice. And they're gearing up to fund work that will help to make that possible, but I think that we'll also connect what people are doing offline with the struggle to make sure that our online spaces are compatible what we're doing offline. So, you know, that's uh, I'm, I know Becky's going to share all the the web addresses and so on, but it's it's it, I think you'll find it really interesting to go on their website and take a look at um, you know some of the ideas that have come up. There's a video of the discussion that's gone on, um, and you know just the, the the fact of the matter is just the digital space we inhabit has has become as important to engage and to participate in as, as the physical space in our cities and communities. Um, and and it's, it's great that, that the, uh, the funders that some of us are somewhat dependent on are, are getting behind that notion. Um, and so I'm going to, with that, wrap up and just, you know, in the interest of shameless self-promotion on my, like, ancient book that's way out of date, just say thanks again. Um, and th there's a couple URLs here, one to um, the, the um, website for my book where I have a blog that has some more recent stuff that I've written, um, and also a project that I haven't talked too much about in, or I haven't talked about at all in, in this presentation because I wanted it to be more broad, but I've got a very kind of early stage project where we're going to be ranking and benchmarking and comparing what companies do um, to respect their users' rights to freedom of expression and privacy, and, and it's We'll hopefully come out with an initial ranking at the end of this year if we get our funding lined up. Um, but uh, but that's um, you know again just trying to work on little pieces of this here and there. So with that, um, I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. Really illuminating and inspirational and also somewhat terrifying. <laughs> so, which is I think how we all feel about a lot of these things. And in fact, um, you just mentioned around the Ranking Digital Rights Project that you know, you're hoping to have some resources ranking how companies are doing. And we have a question from Judy saying, you know, mm -hmm. I'm concerned about the focus on limiting government and law enforcement while private corporations, both American and foreign, can still collect any data they want. So what's being done about mm -hmm. that, or what can we do about that? Is there a way that we can hold people accountable, corporate 
in, in corporate relationships, or are there corporate allies that we can look to who are setting a good example? I know that's a big question. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and it's absolutely true that, that you know, uh, particularly a democratic government, if we can, you know, get it to actually, you know, act in, in, in our will can, can do a lot to help us. And in that web index that I showed, um, the U.S. scores really badly on privacy. And one of the reasons, in addition to the whole issue with the NSA, actually has to do with the fact that there are a lot of countries out there that have much better regulation of companies in terms of how data is collected, how it's shared, how if they're going to do collect or share anything, how they need to disclose it, get your permission, and so on, that there's much clearer re um, regulation of these things in Europe, for instance, um, than there is here. And so pushing for privacy legislation that that would make it harder for abuses to take place, I think is is absolutely part of it. So the government is not always the bad guy. Um, the thing is, we need to make sure that we can hold the government accountable, right? So it's it's kind of a double-edged thing. And similarly with with companies, um, companies do care whether you trust them ultimately. So. Uh, you know, I know some people who've tried to boycott Facebook and didn't really get very far, but I can tell you that, you know, now that Facebook and Twitter are listed on the stock market, that there are socially responsible investors who are going to these companies and, and saying, we expect that you're going to adhere to some some responsible practices when it comes to privacy and freedom of expression, and we want to see evidence of that. And so, you know, just as the the whole socially responsible investment kind of universe has actually been influencing companies for a long time when it comes to labor, when it comes to environmental practices and so on, um, there are some funds that are starting to look at um, – you know, what companies are doing on free expression and privacy. And it's still pretty early, but, you know, the more they get demand, <laughs> the more the more these these investment funds will, will start, you know, and, and this includes like, uh, you know, again, you know, mutual fund companies, not just things that require you to be rich. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's definitely, I think trying to influence companies, part of it is just making your voice heard along with everybody else. And when you're mad about something, don't, don't, ex don't just accept it. Because when there is a user outcry um, about certain things, you do see companies, particular Facebook or, or Google, changing policies when, when their users get upset sort of in large numbers. And particularly then when the users or when angry users hook up with organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, who can then get meetings with high-level executives and say, this is unacceptable and we're going to trash you unless you change it. And that can, that can really sort of help to, you know, I've seen that um, cause changes to, to company policies in the past. And so, you know, it's, there's no kind of silver bullet, but, um, you know, the good news is that there are some things you can do. Um, and, you know, speaking of legislation, I'm seeing, I'm just noticing the questions here, Becky, if you don't mind, um, about FCC net neutrality. And that's another way that, you know, at least in my view, um, and I know that not everybody agrees, but, you know, net neutrality is one of those places where regulation uh, prevents abuse um, and, and helps to protect consumers against um, certain content being more accessible than other content, depending on you know whether 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 a company has a, a an arrangement with another company, and so you know again, um, there's always a fine line. Government needs to be held accountable too, um, but if you have absolutely no regulation. Um, 
you know, there's a, uh, then that, that can also be a problem. You know, there's a reason why we have food safety regulation um, and don't just leave it to the market. Um, and so there's, there's a reason why we need privacy regulation, net neutrality regulation, and so on. In terms of exactly where that's going to get with the FCC, I'd need a bit more of a crystal ball. Um, it, it sounds like it's, it, it, there's going to be, you know, we're, we're in stages of fights that will go on for, for some years. Um, I'm seeing a couple other questions, and Becky, just please interrupt sure. me if, yep. you, if you want me to do something different. Um, but, <laughs> sure. Uh, well, actually, I wanted, to, I wanted yeah. to kind of shift our gear a little bit to sure. some of the, the things you talked about a little bit around access because yeah. you know, a lot of our organizations, you know, whether they're libraries or they're community-based organizations or they run tech centers or maybe they're a shelter that has a computer lab, you know, they're, there are a lot of times the people on the front lines who are providing access to people who don't otherwise have it. And you know, a couple of years ago, Obama had a goal that he announced that he wanted to extend Internet access to 98% of America, and that yeah. that was one of his big telecommunications goals was you know, the corporate America was not going to fill in all of the rural parts of the country uh, with Internet and with broadband in particular, and that he was going to try and make that happen. And I wonder, how do we – how do we know how that's doing? Like, is there a way to know how yeah, we're doing so access that's for a, our community? Yeah, so I have some some colleagues um, at what's called the, the Open Technology Institute who've been working on that particular issue of access much more closely than I have, and I can, I can get you guys some resources on that. But it's definitely, you know, all of this – has been just kind of step by step sort of political battles um, in in terms of who gets to control what resources um, and and so as with many things you know the president saying something's going to happen uh, and and it happening you know are are not the same um, but you know things seem to be moving roughly um, in the in the right direction but. You know, we're we're behind. We're behind on affordability of broadband access um, globally. Um, we're we're behind in terms of access speeds. Um, another person uh, who's been doing a lot of work on this is is named Susan Crawford, who's uh, currently at at Harvard Law School, who has been writing about this quite a lot and um, I think commenting on every t twist and turn. Of, of the access debate as well as the net neutrality debate. Um, but yeah, there's, I can, I'd be happy to send you some resources on that too. In fact, I can That's see great. if I Thank can you. come up and with a couple links while I'm talking. Yeah, that would be great. And you know, in, in that vein, we had a question. You know, for the people who are day-to-day -day providing access in some tangible ways, whether it's at a library or a computer center or um, you know, just helping patrons, boys and girls clubs, things like that, or community members, how do you support and encourage them to go out there and learn about the Internet and experience the Internet, you know, with lots of limitations here and there? You know, you mentioned restrictions around what kind of content they might be able to view while in a library. And David, actually, mm -hmm. one of our participants asked, where do you see the line drawn between freedom of access versus mm -hmm. patron or child protection mm -hmm. where somebody might be looking yeah. at something sexually explicit? And you know, that, that is a real debate. Like how, and I mean, libraries also have some very logistical limitations. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we have a bank of computers, and they limit to 30 or 45-minute chunks of time that yeah. you can sit at them. So how much freedom of access is yeah. there if you – yeah, well exactly. When you when when you have scarce resources and you have legitimate child protection issues and legitimate issues around appropriate content, you know, age appropriate content and and real social responsibilities around that to your community, it's it's you know, absolutely balancing all of that is really hard and you know, there's a lot of commercial web filtering software that that sometimes kind of overblocks things, so it'll keep out the porn, but it also will keep out the sex ed sites and so on. And so, you know, kind of trying to deal with that is always a challenge. But I think what where it comes down ultimately is that you want to be transparent and accountable about your pro policies, so that if people feel that you know you're overdoing it, or people feel that you're being unfair 
you know, the rules are clear. <laughs> the reasons for them are clear. There's, you know, there, there's some way to, to kind of make sure that somebody isn't, you know, abusing other people's freedom of speech. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, it's uh, it's hard because yeah, it's, it's a public resource. Lots of people want to use library computers. You know, it's it's reasonable that people shouldn't be free to stay on for eight hours. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of free as in speech, not as in beer, right? <laughs> um, as as they like to say. <laughs> right. uh, and free and as in so kittens, it's not that either. <laughs> yeah, and and so so just finding just being honest honest when you screw up too you know um as hard as that is i mean and, and i find this you know whether it's with companies or big institutions not just small institutions but but and and just sort of educating yourself about where the problems can come up and sort of being prepared to deal with them because this this happens too with um with big institutions that they'll kind of put in a new piece of software and, and just didn't understand it well enough to to see kind of what the downsides might be, um, and um, yeah, because right. well, and and, with and kind of in how mind. how you're going to have an appeals process if if there's an issue, right? Um, yeah. That's important. Well, and when you mentioned the software thing, we had a couple of people. Sherry asked, and um, also uh, Judy asked. You know that they have concerns around how do they protect themselves against cyber attacks and hackers and things yeah. like that, um, with mm -hmm. the increasing cost, both in time and money, of putting information yep. online. How do organizations, especially you know cash-strapped, time-strapped, limited resource organizations, yeah. um, where do they look to find out what? is going to protect them, what's going to help them. You know, Sherry commented that they were told recently that cyber attacks are not covered by general liability insurance and they need to make sure their mm. data is better protected. Where can they yeah. look for resources on how to do that, especially when they don't have the time and money and they also may not want to restrict uh, Internet freedom to you know, the people in their office or the people they serve? Yeah, no, this is this is again a real problem cuz there there's some software that helps you protect your network that also makes it possible to surveil your users and so, you know, it, again it's it's a double-edged um issue. There are a number of organizations and I think TechSoup is is kind of one of them that provide resources to to nonprofits for where to go for cybersecurity advice um, that's that's affordable for a nonprofit. Um, we didn't I'm, even plan I'm, that plug, so I you know you that. didn't even plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> full disclosure, that just that was my own. That came from me. Nobody asked me to say that, um, but but it's true. There are a lot of uh, there are a number of organizations that for for more kind of activisty or journalistic organizations, but I, I you know and more kind of self defense Defense, if you feel that you're going to be targeted, there's there's an organization called Tactical Tech um, that that provides a suite of, of free tools for 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 protecting your data, protecting your sources, protecting your own communications. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has some resources on that on that self defense uh, website, although that's more for for kind of surveillance rather than for defending against cyber attacks. Um, but yeah, there are starting to be a number of of you know the, these funders out there who are now kind of waking up. They're starting to fund some projects that are that are meant to directly service um, nonprofits to kind of help deal with the cybersecurity problem. And I don't have you know other than TechSoup, I don't have like a bunch of links handy on cybersecurity advice. But I'm pretty sure that TechSoup has some of those. Because I yeah, think I saw we'll something sure on your include, website not um, long ago. <laughs> yeah, we do. And we actually have yeah. um, a guide that we recently put out on online security and privacy and a whole bunch of resources. Yeah. So I'll be sure to include some of those in the follow-up email as well. Um, we have just a couple minutes left, so I'll ask another question here. Um, Allie asks, uh, you know, can you speak to any of the movements that work to empower you know, marginalized communities or people mm -hmm. of color, immigrants that may not have net freedom and that helps, uh, you know, calls on their experience around restricted human rights and freedoms. Like how do we, mm -hmm. how can we bring those communities into this? And in particular for organizations that are 
direct service that are serving communities that may not be mm -hmm. in the know on all of these topics already. Yeah. You know, we want to make sure yeah. that their voices are heard. Yeah, well there's one organization who who I've I've met some of the people who who work with them and for them called Color of Change. I think the URL is colorofchange.org and I'm just going to their website right now. I'm not sharing my browser but the, on the front page they they have a thing about internet freedom. Um but they they very much sort of connect, you know, for 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 minority con communities um, for economically disadvantaged communities, um, kind of what are, how do these issues connect? How does big data, uh, how does surveillance, how does net neutrality sort of connect up to um, communities that, that uh, yeah, I think it's colorofchange.org, all one word. Um, you know, so they they have a bunch of resources, definitely, um, and you know they're not just working on online issues; it's sort of offline as well. Um, but that's one organization I know of. I, I do know that. Um, uh, let's see. There's also as um, I had a slide earlier um, to a web page um, for the leadership conference. And I think their URL is civilrights.org, great URL. Um, and uh, they they very much have a whole bunch of resources as well um, around precisely this kind of issue. Well, terrific. Thank you so much for that. And we'll be sure to include those links in the follow-up email. If you have additional questions for our audience, uh, or if our audience has additional questions, they can go mm -hmm. ahead and continue the conversation, share their experiences, and ask more in the Tech for Good forum, which we'll have a link to at the top of the follow-up email. If you right. would take a moment and let us know today what did you learn? And it could be something that you're going to try to implement or something that you're going to think more about. Um, and this is just to help kind of recap a little bit of what we talked about today. So feel free to chat into us to let us know what you learned. And, and one of our participants shared something already in there. Um, thank you so much, Rebecca. Really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our audience about this today. It is so important, and it is the kind of roadmap of what the world is going to look like in the coming decades because you know we're all carrying little computers in our pockets and yet have very little direct control over what's happening with the information that's collected there. So it's great to have all of these resources and how we can have a voice in it and how we can enable well, our communities for having to have me. a voice in it. Really yeah, appreciate it. Well, so, Go yeah, ahead. thank you so much. I'm, my father is a history professor, so I, I like to take the long view um, <laughs> on life. And in the short run, everything's really scary. But in the long run, you know, I think history shows if like people take, get actively involved, things can move in the right direction. It's just Absolutely. not in a straight line. And, I mean, ever. We saw that with. <laughs> tens of thousands of comments being posted to the really wonky FCC website last fall. That's right. <laughs> like the most they'd ever received ever. Exactly. Cumulative. Never so give here, up. Exactly. So <laughs> here are some additional resources, and again, we'll point to those in the follow-up email. Lastly, I'd like to invite you to join us for upcoming webinars. We'll be covering a variety of topics in the coming weeks, uh, starting with next Wednesday talking about inclusive information access around assistive technologies in libraries. And then we'll be talking about tech donations for religious and faith-based organizations on Thursday. Following that, we'll have a series of two webinars for people using QuickBooks to handle their accounting, both for new users and existing nonprofit users. So we hope you'll join us for some of those events coming soon. You can find us at TechSoupGlobal.org, TechSoup.org, on Facebook or on Twitter. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for your participation today. And thank you to our audience for being so active in asking these wonderful questions and sharing your learnings. Lastly, I'd like to thank ReadyTalk, our webinar sponsor, who provided the use of today's platform for us to present this webinar. We're using their ReadyTalk 500 tool, which is also available in TechSoup's catalog at TechSoup.org slash ReadyTalk. Please take a moment when you leave this window to complete the post-event survey to help us to continue improving our webinar program. Thank you all so much and have a terrific day. Bye-bye.